us the intensity regarding race, what our children should learn about the past, and whose role it is to teach them. There's Russia's attack on Ukraine, millions fleeing for their lives, food and fuel supplies strained across the world. And what this means for elections, for truth, and for this country's future. For the next hour, for the first time, the three Iowa Republicans who believe they can best serve the state's third congressional district will debate here on the Des Moines Area Community College Urban Campus, all with their eyes on the upcoming June primary and Democrat Cindy Axney, who awaits the winner in November's general election. From your local election headquarters, this is the U.S. House debate for Iowa's 3rd District. And welcome to the first debate between the three Republicans running in Iowa's 3rd Congressional District. We are live here at the DMACC Urban Campus in Des Moines. Thanks to President Rob Denson for hosting us today. Thanks to the Polk County Republican Party and Chair Gloria Mazza for helping us to organize. I'm Dave Price. We appreciate you joining with us here. Just so you know a little background here, you'll see three podiums up before us today. We randomly drew yesterday trying to keep everything fair here. So here is our podium order that we've figured out after the draw here. So let's introduce our candidates. We'll get over the we'll go over the rules here in a second. But as we go left to right here, we have Gary Leffler, the West Des Moines business consultant. Thanks for being here. Zach Nunn is in the middle here, state senator from Bondurant. And on the right there, Nicole Hasso, a financial services executive from Johnston. Thank you all for agreeing to do this. Thank all right, so the rules. We don't have a long <laughs> list here. We try to keep it simple, but the short of it is we don't have any buzzers, no gongs. Yeah, no gimmicky whatever. So we're going to bank on the fact that uh, we are truly Iowa nice, but we can be Iowa brief here. So we're going to ask all of you to be very, very brief. You've already practiced your stump speeches. We don't want to hear them. Everybody here and a lot of you back home already know these things. So please, please keep this short. And it's my job to kind of keep this train going here right on track, sir. All right, question one here. We're going to go left to right. Uh, Mr. Leffler, since you're in that uh, first position here. Uh, this was a question we got. So looking back at your background here, both professional and personal, what is the quality you think makes you the best choice in this race that you have? Well, thank you for the question, Dave. I'm grassroots. Iowa is grassroots. Dave, I think you would uh, even acknowledge that in 2016, no one predicted that Donald Trump was going to be our president. And also Mike Huckabee came and he represented Iowa. And Rick Santorum drove around in an old rusty car, and he won. So what we're finding out today is that Iowa is grassroots, and I'm 100% grassroots. As I drive across Iowa, uh, even when I was, got into DMAC here today, Dave, uh, one of the students says, I saw you here, and the maintenance guy said, hey, Gary, you're here today. So we're well known across the state of Iowa, and we appreciate the opportunity to serve Iowa's third congressional district. All right, Mr. Nunn, your best quality you're bringing to this race. Well, thanks, Dave, and thank you to DMAC for putting this all together. You know, in my opinion, it's really about service. It's a quality that I've tried to grow in ever since I first joined the military. It's a quality of service that I believe strongly was imbued into me and my community here, and that I've tried to serve both at the State House. And it's a quality that when I see things like the Biden administration abandon Afghanistan, that service drew us back to be able to save Americans left behind. It's a quality of service that says, in my community, we are looking for growth domestically, and that's why we cut taxes. It's a quality that says, being a father of six kids, service is something that I want to give on to them, and I think it's best done by leading by example. And so we're proud to be able to serve our community because our community took time to raise my family, and we're giving back. All right, Ms. Hasso, what's your best quality you're bringing here? You know, America is about we the people. It's the I am we the people. It's not about we the politician. It's not about we the elite. It's about we the people. The last 14 years I spent in the financial industry helping people secure their financial future. And that was so important. And now I am running for US Congress to make sure that we're able to secure the future of our grandkids and our great-grandkids. 
And that's why I'm running for U.S. Congress. All right, thank you. Uh, as you might guess, uh, some of the questions we had planned here, the order may have shifted after the breaking news that we've had the last uh, 24 hours. So uh, to catch everybody up, Politico has reported that there is a draft copy that could be a little foreshadowing into the U.S. Supreme Court's thinking when it's, it comes big picture at the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion in our country here. So we're going to dig into this on a variety of levels here. Let's start with the three of you, please. In your mind, uh, should all abortions be illegal in this country? Hand up if you say yes. All abortions. Just to be clear. All, abor all abortions, no exceptions, should be but, illegal. So you all think there should be no exceptions. And, and Dave, let's, let's not do the gimmicky trick here, respectfully. Let's recognize that you know we've got three great candidates up here. We all believe in life. We've been on the campaign trail saying we believe in life. Let's look at what the alternative is, and what just came out from Senator Schumer this morning, that they would go in a far left, radical view of an abortion on demand policy that they're trying to take to Congress today. So there's, there's the other side of this question here of, do you believe in abortion in any case, at any time, whether it's um, partial birth or post-birth situation where a child would be put to death? And I think all of us would say that is wrong. Well, right? I just want to say in 2002, I had a miscarriage. My, I was 11 weeks, six days pregnant. And I gave birth to my son, who had 10 fingers, 10 toes, he had eyeballs. And that was the hardest thing I had to do in life. There is nothing more important than life itself. My husband tried to help me. I was in a place where I did not know how I was going to get out mentally. But by the grace of God, by knowing that one day I will see my son again in heaven and that he is watching his mama right now standing on this podium fighting for every other child who is being murdered day after day after day. They put those Planned Parenthood places in the black communities to control the population. Where is the outrage in that? So I will be 100% standing for life, from conception to the grave. Okay, uh, Mr. Nunn, and we're not doing gotcha like questions here. What we're trying to do, that. hold on one sec. We just wanna, what we're trying to do here is show any differences. So if you're all in agreement, then we can, we can move forward here. But uh, uh, Mr. Nunn, for your, your uh, deeper question here. So uh, this would, if this goes through uh, in June and they strike this down here, essentially, this goes back to the state's big picture, but mm. is there a role in Congress, do you believe, for this issue going forward, if it indeed goes this way in June? Yeah, so let's, let's look at what is a very personal involvement of the life of a child and the role of a mother. And we should not be unempathetic to the fact that women's right to health care is a real right and should be protected. But so is the life of an unborn child. You know, as a foster parent of two kids right now, along with our four, there is no greater burden as a parent and privilege as a person than to help to be able to bring life into our communities. I have been a strong defender of life, both on the battlefield, as a parent, and at the State House. And I think, Dave, you're absolutely right. When we look at what we have done in the State House, it's not just about talking about it, it's about doing things. And here in Iowa, we have led. We have led on the heartbeat bill, and we have said no to late-term abortions in our state. But when you look at the other side, they're in a position where they are looking at the gruesome act of an extreme element of post or partial birth abortion, of late-term abortion. They're going so far as to say just today that they would tear down the filibuster so they could push through a congressional act. They're going so far as to say that they would pack the courts to ensure that their liberal view on abortion on demand is something that they can have. Okay. Now to add so to is, that, is, so there is there a role for Congress here or not? I, under the 10th Amendment, this should be back to the states, okay. exactly where it's designated. Okay, Ms. Hasso, I will get to you third. Yeah, absolutely. It should definitely be the job of the state. But we need to keep in mind that it is not an it. It is a child. It is a human life. 
And New York is ready to, after 28 days, 23 days, I believe, ready to kill a baby after they, are, they have been born. Our children are a blessing to us. And for us to sit here and have, this, have to have this conversation, is, it's, it's unacceptable. Our children are a blessing to us. And we need to make sure that we are protecting our children at all costs. Mr. Leffler, what would your role in Congress be when it comes to this issue if this does go this way in June? Well, I think when you go to Congress, it's about leadership. It may not always come up on the House floor. It may not always come up on the Senate floor. But people are watching you as a congressman. What kind of leader are you going to be when you have a divisive, controversial issue like this? We saw in Virginia where they wanted to have the baby born and put it on a table and decide what was going to be done with it. We've got out there in California right now where they want to wait for weeks afterwards determining whether they should continue that life or not. I can say this, when we were at the, when the, all of the right to life people and the pro-life people were down at the Capitol building and the rotunda was filled, Pastor Terry Amon sits there right there in the front row. This is a very important issue to Iowans. And I think that the, the way that the direction that this is going to go is it's going to come back in each, it's going to be a historical moment, Dave, because each individual state will determine what happens with this issue. For the first time, Iowans will have an opportunity to vote on this and let the will of the people be made known. Let the will of the people preside over how this, the direction that this heads, because we're tired. We're tired of Washington, D.C. and its dominance over what happens here in Iowa. Let's put Iowans back in control of this issue. I think that's absolutely critical. Okay, one of the uh, economic issues, obviously dealing with uh, impacting everybody right now, or the, it's the price of everything right, right. now, right? <laughs> We're seeing the highest rate of inflation in about 40 years here. Uh, there may be numerous factors behind this, but can we safely assume before we jump into this, all of you think President Biden has had a role in this by spending too much money? Is that fair? Absolutely. He's right. responsible. Right. This is a Republican primary, so it's kind of a safe <laughs> bet here, right? <laughs> All right. As we drill down into this, as we look at our state here, Iowa has been awarded $9.31 billion in federal COVID-19 relief from a variety of different ways here. Uh, for perspective, that's about a billion more than the state's yearly general fund budget here. So if COVID-19 stimulus here impacted the rate of inflation here, then does a governor have a responsibility to give some of this back, to decline some of this federal money? Uh, you, as you know, Governor Reynolds turned down about $95 million of the $9.31 billion here. So Ms. Hasso, we'll start with you on this one. But if all of this money leads to inflation, it's making stuff too expensive for people. Should governors say, we don't want some of this? send it back to federal taxpayers and the treasury? <laughs> Absolutely. I think we need to make sure as, as an example to the rest of the country that we are being fiscal responsible. That if we are not going to use that money and we're just going to sit on it, it needs to go back. Because you know what? At the end of the day, it's the taxpayer's money. It's not their money. It is the taxpayer's money. You are in office because of the taxpayer. We the people. We have placed you there to be a leader for us, to be a voice for us. And if you are no longer being that voice, then we need to terminate you. So if, if state legislators use that to sort of cushion the possibility of, giving, of doing tax cuts here, as some of those discussions were, is that the right thing, the right use of this money, if they haven't spent it? If they haven't spent it, they need to send it back. Okay. Mr. Leffler? Well... Right now, America's living on a credit card in a candy store, and we're all on a sugar high. And it needs to stop, and it needs to stop now. This idea of doling money out. I've got eight grandchildren. Most of us in this room have children or grandchildren. When are we going to stop giving the shovel to them of the debt that we are piling up? It's time that we have a congressman that says no, David. And it's time that we have, because they don't say no. Why? Because they want to get reelected. You've got a congressman right here that will say no. Uh, needs to stop. Mr. Nunn, fair or unfair here? Because, you, you know, as you yeah. were part of this debate up at the State House, there were some people who say, well, this doesn't really make much sense if you've got federal taxpayers right. sending us money, and then it's going to help buffer the state tax cuts to Iowans. Is that really the right use of this money if it wasn't spent? 
How so do you respond? Dave, great question here. And I think what is before us is the fact that Iowa has a AAA bond rating. We have managed well. We have consistently been a state that not only balances its budget, but the money that we do have, we reinvest. And right now we've got a billion dollars in surplus that we have raised because our economy has grown. But the real question here is, how do we do that? We didn't do that by getting a bunch of federal dollars and then sending it back to Washington, because God knows where that money would have ended up if Iowa would have sent it back. But it wouldn't have been helping our state. It would end up somewhere in a blue state. And the reality is, is that when we cut taxes, two of the largest tax cuts in Iowa's history happened in the last four years. I was proud to lead on both of those. We returned $2 billion back to Iowans. That's in each one of our communities. It's in our main streets. It's in our farms. It's in our uh, families' pockets. It helps me fill up my minivan. These are the things that actually grow a community, not the inflation dollars that come out of Washington, D.C. and drive up the cost of everything. Inflation is the highest it's been in my lifetime. And that didn't just happen. That was a result of poor planning by Washington to try and fire hose down an economy in a way that didn't actually invest in communities. What the state of Iowa, I think, has done very well and can be a model for other countries and other uh, the U.S. government is to be able to say, let's set a budget, let's live within our means, and when we collect more revenue because the economy is growing, let's give that back to Iowans because that's Iowans' dollars, and they grow their economy. But does the governor, should the governor have sent more of this back? So you did send the, the unused portion of it back to Washington, and even that, we saw that $94 million ended up, it's not like it went back down to pay down the, the national debt, right? It got farmed out to other states, overwhelmingly to blue states. So my concern here is taxpayers sent that money to Washington. I don't want Washington flushing it down the toilet on pet projects when places like Iowa are actually giving it back to taxpayers. We're going to try to work in as many of the questions as we can that viewers sent in. Uh, there's no way we're going to get to all of them. Uh, but uh, as you might guess, a bunch of them had to do with uh, the, the cost of things right now and also the workforce situation. So we have a question here, candidates from Beatrice Tepper, and she was specifically talking about the challenges of child care, both finding workers and affording it for families here. And she's wondering what can be done to try to make this a more workable solution. So part of this for her is the concern about a lot of people who work in the industry don't make a lot of money. So especially right now where you can go somewhere else and make a lot more money, how can these child care centers meet the needs of families when they can't find, can't find workers? Mr. Leffler, I think this one is yours to go first. So what, what role can Congress have to try to help this? What role can Congress have? Number one thing that we need to do is we need to attack this inflation. Inflation is hurting all Americans like never before. The dollars, there's a lot more month left at, and then there are dollars. And until we correct that situation, we've got to rein in spending. But to these, to these families that are trying to get by, Dave, when the cost of gas has doubled, when the cost of going to the grocery store has doubled, inflation is like a noose around America's neck. And the longer we let that go, and the longer that we have a Congress, and with all due respect, Zach, give that money back. That's part of the problem. We can't sit there and say, hey, we want all the dollars from Washington, D.C., and continue this rapid spending. Can't do it. Send a congressman there that will say no, because that helps out these families. That's what's going to help these families out. You know, when most of the people here today, if you have children or grandchildren, how expensive is daycare? Talking about inflation, it's not just the young families, Dave. How about our senior citizens that are on fixed incomes? If we sit here and just think, this thing's gonna go on and on and on, it's just the deeper and bigger the hole gets. Okay, Mr. Nunn, uh, what can Congress do, if anything, to try to help specifically with the child care worker situation part of this? Yeah, Dave, great question. I think we've done some exceptional work here in Iowa, and we should use that as a model going forward. You know, here, our governor and our legislature, and I was proud to pass grants for 9,000 additional child care spots in the state. And here's why that's important. Because in order for rural Iowa to be able to have enough children in a child care facility, they've got to hit at least a minimum. And if you don't have that, then you find out that that child care center can't stay open. And that continues to crush our rural communities in Iowa because they have nowhere that their families can go. You know, I've got three kids in daycare right now. That is a hefty bill. The inflation rate alone is going to put on my family upwards of 5,200. That's for the average Iowa family. 5,200 additional dollars that you will pay out of pocket just to be able to afford getting through this year. 
When you try to take your child to a child care facility, if Congress doesn't identify this as a priority and make real meaningful investment in our individual small businesses and not have a government takeover of child care, then we are crushing not only small entrepreneurs, small businesses, but all the families that thrive because of their child care support. And so when I talk to Megan at my daycare and she tells me about the challenges facing her, it's workforce, it's cost, it's capability. And what we have done here in Iowa is try to say, let's expand that opportunity so that more people can get into early child care facilities, that more rural communities have the child care coverage that they need, and that the government can be a partner in this, but that we never take it away from the private so would you do it on the federal? Are you, are you saying you do it on federal level, what you did at state? Absolutely okay. right. All right, Ms. Hasso, what's your solution? So, you know, the federal government has a work workforce team. Um, why not utilize that wor workforce team to make sure that we're getting the right people in the right place at the right time and making sure that we are helping those small businesses daycare. I remember when my kids were in daycare and how expensive it was. And, and the day that they didn't have to go to daycare anymore, I, I think we celebrated and went out to dinner for that, for that night because we got a pay raise. Actually, Actually, and, and it's hard and it's the reality is we're in we're experiencing the highest inflation that we have seen in forever and this administration is responsible for it and they need to come up help come up with solutions and not add to the problem and not be looking at uh, the bill back better but what can we do to help real Americans when was the last time this administration stood up for real Americans. When we are losing a full paycheck before, because of inflation, so if you get 26 paychecks in a year, now you're down to 25. So what, what, will, what will help here? What are you saying will help find the workers? We have to, we have to, let the, we have to hold the workforce committee accountable to roll up their sleeves and to get to work. Too many people have been sitting in, in D.C. twiddling their thumbs, and we have not seen any results. It is time that the people in Washington, D.C. actually start working for the people who are paying their paychecks. The reality, Dave, though, is this. Like Janelle, she watches our four grandkids. For a lot of people, it's a family involvement in order to be able to afford child care. So that why? So that... Daniel and Megan can go to work. Chanel goes over and watches the grandkids. A lot of families are pulling together in order to make this work. A lot of times, we don't need government. We need people working together and pulling together. It's, it's who would you want to watch your grandchildren other than Janelle Leffler? I mean, she is <laughs> the grandparent of the universe. I mean, they read books, they do everything, they go on hikes, they go on adventures, they I do everything. I hope this is not her Mother's Day president, because it's too cheap to buy her a card here. Dave, you've got to work with me. I all right, we've got to get this. one more question, and I hope here before we're our halfway point here, and that was submitted by our, our guest who's sitting in the front row, Rob Denson, the president of DMAC here. He's talking about uh, DACA recipients here and their, their, their place in the workforce, their place in the educational system. So he's saying once they get to post-secondary education, they're not eligible for federal help like Pell Grants and such. Uh, Mr. Nunn, I think, I think we're first to you on this one here. Uh, should, they, should they become eligible for any kind of federal help to go to, go to post-secondary education? And what's your place in the workforce here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, President Denson, I think you see it best when you see young DACA recipients go through the process and then be forced in this oblivious situation where do they get kicked out of the country or do they become part of the workforce? The reality is we've already made an investment in these individuals. Let's have a pathway for citizenship. But I'd offer President Denson, this goes to the larger question of what's happening in our country, particularly at our southern border. We have an administration that's allowing two million illegals to come into this country. Who does that hurt most? I'd offer it hurts the DACA recipients who have gone through the process the right way. When we get to a situation where our southern border becomes a porous invite for liberal governors in California to say, we'll give away free health care, we'll give away free support and free entitlements, that's taking away from folks who need it most. So here's my pledge. One, let's secure the southern border. I've flown missions down there. I have seen the drug trafficking, the human trafficking, the catastrophe on that border. Personally, let's stop that human suffering. And two, let's come up with a pathway for people who want to come to this country and can be a great value add. 
whether they be doctors or frontline farm workers, to get on board in a, in a most expeditious way versus what now is taking years, sometimes decades, before they have the opportunity to become U.S. citizens, even though they've worked hard and done it the right way to get here. Okay, Ms. Hasso? Yes, no one should ever live life not knowing what their future is going to be. And we should definitely put together a pathway to citizenship for them. Now, in order for that to happen, it's not an option. We have to secure that border. And we need to build that wall. And until we do that, we cannot move forward. And then we need to make sure that our Border Patrol agents have the support that they need and they have the technology that they need to do their job effectively. And then Congress needs to sit down and actually address the elephant in the room. When are we going to stop dancing around immigration? We need to sit down and roll up our sleeves and address what needs to happen in our country. So what needs to happen? <laughs> we need to come up with solutions. Are we going to allow people to come into the country and just have them be a part, a drain on the economy? Or are we going to allow people to come into the country and actually add to the economy? We have to address those questions. And we have to address those people who have come, come across the border. We have no idea where they're at. We have no idea what they're doing. And we need to make sure that that is being taken care of. We, there's different options that's out there on the table. I am willing and ready to roll up my sleeve. And let's discuss it. Let's find out, do we use the point system? Well, however that looks like, we need to make sure that we are doing the right thing and putting America first. Okay, Mr. Leffler, we're coming up on the break, but you get the, you get the final thoughts here of this question. So where, should any uh, federal help, Pell Grants and such, help the DACA recipients go to college, go to secondary, post-secondary, whatever it is? I believe that America is a land of opportunity. My grandfather came here in 1857, and his father died when he was in the third grade. And that American dream that he had as a nine-year-old running a family farm when I work with the Hispanic people on different construction sites, guess what? They have that same dream about being Americans and having exploring the opportunity. Yes, we should open up the door. We should give them that opportunity. What I see is this. People that we know in our apartment complex, David, people have been there for eight, 10 years trying to get citizenship and getting the life sucked out of them by lawyers that were stopping them from getting citizenship. On the farm, going back to the fence, we had a real good saying on the farm, good fences make good neighbors. President Trump had this right. Build the wall. Back the border agents. Do the laws. Enforce the laws. That's what you need to do. We need to have a congressman that will go down there to the border and check it out. I've been to the border myself. And we need to do that. I could give you, I, I wish I had time to share a story with you, but uh, we're limited on time. But the guy that the tractor came from, was, his name was John Sedlatsky. He was in the Polish army, captured by the Germans. And in 1953, he came to America. And thank God for John Sedlatsky in my life. And he loved America. All right, we have to take our one and only break here uh, now. Uh, when we come back, we want to talk about election security. And Congresswoman Cindy Axney also has a question for all three of you. All right. We'll do that when we come back yeah. in our live debate here at DMAX <laughs> Urban Campus in Des Moines. Stay with us.